doing well in the midst of this pandemic, as he has talked about, knowing that all of our world is being turned upside down as this virus spreads across all the world, I thought, well, I would suspend our normal series called Love Your Neighbor and just focus on how we as a church, as a body of faith, can get through this crisis. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 1.7 this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but a power, love, and self-discipline. So I want you to circle some words there, and that is power, love, and self-discipline. Now, I'm going to need a little self-discipline today. We're having a new roof put on our church. They started this week. <clears throat> we had no idea they were going to be here this morning, okay? Uh, but they're on the roof, and if you hear this crazy sound like, that, they're drilling. We're having a metal roof put on, all right? So I hope uh, my microphone will filter that out for you. But if you happen to hear it, it's nothing wrong with your website. It's just we're having to deal with another issue here. And I don't know if it's fear that if our state shuts down, they would not be able to finish it. So they're trying to get it done in time. But you have power. You have power from God to get through this. You have the love of Jesus Christ to get through this. And you have the self-discipline that the Holy Spirit can give you. Now, God wants us to have these things so that we're not controlled by fear. We're not controlled by anxiety. Look at Romans 8.37. Despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus who loved us. So we already have the victory through trusting God. Therefore, we don't have to fear or be motivated or controlled by fear in this pandemic. In fact, the Bible gives us this wonderful promise in Romans 8. It says this. The powers of hell cannot separate us from God's love. So if the powers of hell cannot separate us from God's love, neither can this coronavirus. So we're going to keep worshiping God. We're going to stay connected, as Pastor Christian shared with you, through online groups. We're going to still keep the gospel out in our community, our state, the nation, and the world. Now, if you notice this past week, the dam finally broke. Okay, And the United States declared this a uh, national emergency uh, the World Health Organization officially declared this as a pandemic. And it created what I call the ripple effect or the domino effect. And all of a sudden, things began to happen very quickly. No longer could we congregate in large groups. Schools are closed. Concerts are canceled. I mean, think about it. Disney World and Universal are closed. All of the things we're used to doing that brought us together, we can no longer do. You can still go to restaurants and order your food, but you can't sit in a restaurant and eat anymore. Now, we've never had a crisis like this in my lifetime that I know of. So I want you to know that I have some good words for you today to give you some hope, to strengthen your faith so that you're not controlled by fear. And last week, every media there is on television and social media, they just poured more fuel on this fire that is already raging. It became a wind. You remember the winds in Australia that just fueled the fires across the Australian outback. Our media, trying to keep us informed, have added more fuel to this, and as a result, it's created panic. It's created fear. Have you tried to go to a grocery store lately? I mean, simple things as meat and bread and milk, and really, what we really need, toilet paper, is hard to find. I mean, people panicked. They feared they would run out, so everybody ran to the stores, and as a result, Shelves are, are empty. Now stores are restocking as they get supplies. But here's what I want you to know. If you are a Christ follower, if you have put your trust in Jesus Christ, this is the time to reinforce your faith, not your fear. One of my favorite passages is often used at funerals, but I think it applies even in this time. It's Psalm 23, verses 1 and 4. David writes, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And when I look at that passage there that you see on your computer screen, it tells us the Lord is our shepherd, meaning he has several obligations, several responsibilities. And part of the role of a shepherd is to protect his sheep from predators, from danger, even from the environmental issues. And one of God's responsibilities is to meet your needs. And David realizes that, like in verse 4, 
Sometimes we go through in life what we would call the valley of shadow of death. It may not be real death, but it is so dark. It's hard to see the light of hope anywhere. For some people, this coronavirus is going to be deadly. Experts are telling us they're not in agreement yet. Anywhere from 1% to 2% of the people who have already contracted, contact, contracted this disease have died. So what I want to do today is to give you some biblical truth that will reinforce your faith and hopefully subside your fear. I'm calling this the mountain of fear called the coronavirus. So how do we get over this mountain of fear called the coronavirus? I want to give you seven biblical truths this morning. Here's the first thing that I want you to remember. This virus that came to pass will not last. We're going to go through this together as a church family. You will not be alone in this. This is, this is what I call a coronavirus valley. We've had them before. If you remember things like the swine flu and MRSA, SARS, and Zika. And all of these superbugs, as they're called, have a beginning, they have a peak, they have a decline, and they have an end. And what you see and what you hear on the news right now from experts is just simple, common sense information that we all need to do to reduce the spread of this virus, as well as bring about a decline of it. So do the common sense things they're telling us to do, like washing your hands, keeping your distance, all of this is not to create more harm to us, but to keep us healthy. So do these simple common sense suggestions. In our, in our culture now, in America, we are quarantining those who have contacted the disease, contracted the disease. We are now quarantining those who think they may have. But we also are trying to keep those who are healthy, healthy. So these are just good suggestions we all need to follow. Look at 1 Peter 4.12. Dear friends, don't be surprised or shocked that you're going through testing that is like walking through fire. The Bible's very clear in this life we're going to have tribulations. We're going to have a difficult time. This earth is not perfect. This world is not perfect. So we're not to be surprised when bad things happen. I mean, the very earth that gives us beautiful sunshiny days also gives us earthquakes and tornadoes, volcanic eruptions and floods. If we go back to Genesis 1, God created a perfect world. He put Adam and Eve in it, and they, of their own free will, chose to disobey God and bring sin into it. And when that happened, not only did humanity fall, nature fell as well. Now, God created everything perfect, but we are the ones who ruin it. We're the ones who bring harm. We're the ones who bring hurt. We're the ones who harass. We are the ones who are not holy. And that's why in Crisis like these, Jesus emphasized that there's a prayer we should be more intentional about praying. You know, it's called the Lord's Prayer. And the very first two verses say this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because on earth, God's will is rarely ever fully done. Our earth is full of sickness and sadness and sorrow and stress. This is what we find here. And very few people on this planet rarely choose to do God's will consistently. And as a result, the sin they commit has consequences that we all have to deal with. So look at 2 Corinthians 4. Paul says, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that will vastly outweigh them forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. I want you to circle a phrase there. The phrase is, won't last very long. This will be temporary. This coronavirus, this new one, COVID-19, is not here forever. It ha it will have, it's had its beginning. It'll have its peak. It'll have its decline, and then it will die. But until that happens, we're all having to make major adjustments. And we're going to have to make even future major adjustments as this thing begins to reach its peak. For example, many schools are already closed. States are closing schools all across the nation. 
parents are struggling, parents who work, what do I do with my children? Even this week, our own YMCA said they are closing down the after-school program for parents. Parents who work need people to take care of their children. Also, we have servers and other people in other businesses that are being laid off right now. They will have a huge economic loss. Now, this isn't just the role of government to take care of. It's also the role of the church. God created the church to do this. Now, this virus will not last. Look at Ecclesiastes. For everything, there's a season. A time for every activity under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. So everything has a beginning and everything has an end. Listen to me. Remember this. This virus that came to pass... It will not last. Here's a second biblical truth I want you to remember that will help you overcome this fear, this mountain of fear called the coronavirus. Remember, what we know as fact eliminates what is false. The Apostle Paul had a lot to say about this. Look at 2 Corinthians 1.7. He says this, Our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in God's comfort. Now, there's three little phrases there I want you to circle. One is our hope. One is, is firm. And because we know. So if you put those all together, what Paul says, our hope is firm because we know. We know. Paul says, listen, if we will trust what we know, it gives us hope we will get through this. And what's important now is for us to trust the facts that our leaders are giving us. And as we trust those facts, they help reinforce our faith. There's a, there's a myth among a lot of Christians. And that is, we can't have scientific facts mixed with our faith. We can, and we should. And reminding ourselves of these facts helps our faith get stronger. It gives us courage. It gives us confidence. It gives us calmness. Because this thing has not peaked yet. And the Bible makes it very clear that we should know the facts before we make any major decision or commit to anything. Jesus worded this way, count the cost. Know what you're having to deal with before you commit to dealing with it. And this means that not everything you hear on the news, on social media, is the truth. I mean, let me ask you this. Do you believe everything you hear or read in the newspaper, on radio, on the internet, on social media, and on the news? No, nobody does. Look at Proverbs 14, 15. The gullible believe anything they're told. The prudent sift and weigh every word. So not everyone who speaks on the internet or social media or on TV or the radio know fully everything they're talking about, especially when it comes to, to this coronavirus. So as your pastor, I'm telling you, be selective. Listen, some people in the days and weeks ahead will have their own agenda to capitalize on in this crisis. Let me give you two major ones I've already noticed since this thing broke the news. There will be somebody, some people who see this crisis as a political advantage. They will talk about conspiracy theories. They will start blaming the government, blaming the president, blaming Congress. Well, blaming doesn't help at all. It doesn't help us deal with this at all. They will go to fault finding. And if you watch the news, you already see this taking place. There are people trying to use this for their political advantage. Here's another way people will use this for their own advantage. Financial advantage. Just recently, two brothers, Matt and Noah Calvin, they live near Chattanooga, Tennessee. They went on a 1,300-mile trip with a U-Haul. They went to every store they could find when they heard of the first death of the coronavirus in the United States. They bought every sanitizer they could, and they bought every package of antibacterial wipes they could. They filled up this U-Haul, and they began selling this anywhere from $8 to $70. That's price gouging. Well, interestingly, they've come under the scrutiny of the eternal general in their state, and they're now giving these things away. Listen, in our culture, in our country, the most vulnerable are our elderly. And these people are going to prey on them and they're going to scare them. They will offer fake remedies. Do not believe any of this stuff. I don't know if you know, you probably remember the name of Jim Baker. 
Jim and Tammy Faye Baker, who used to have the PTL Club, just this past week on his show, he had a guest who had this thing called Silver Solution. She claimed that it would kill, it had killed coronaviruses in the past within 12 hours, and it even would kill HIV. And she said, I have no reason to doubt that it will kill this one. Well, Jim Baker is being sued by several states for false advertisement. Listen, if there was a cure, our government would tell us. Look at Proverbs 13, 16. Every sensible person acts from what? Knowledge. Meaning the wise person, the sensible person, doesn't act out of fear. They don't act out of their feelings. They act out of facts. The Bible repeatedly tells us that when we are in a crisis, we should get the facts first. We shouldn't make our decisions based on fakes or fallacies or faulty statistics or fantasies. We shouldn't base our, feeling, our, our, our decisions on fear or even on our feelings because our feelings will lie to us. Look at Proverbs 18, 13. What a shame. Yes, how stupid to decide before knowing the facts. So get the facts from reputable officials on this coronavirus. Look at Proverbs 18.2. A foolish person does not want to understand anything. He only enjoys telling others what he thinks. And if you go on social media right now, <laughs> everybody's got an opinion about how we should deal with this bug, this virus. Listen, trust our experts. Look at Proverbs 14 and 8. The wise man looks ahead. The fool attempts to fool himself and won't face facts. So do you get it? What does it say about fools? They just only fool themselves with their own opinion. But people who are wise get the real facts. That's why Proverbs 23, 23 puts it this way. Get the facts at any price. Hold on tightly to all the good sense you can get. So what the Bible is telling us in this, remember this. Facts will eliminate the false. We should not be telling people to only limit their life to their faith. In a crisis like this, we need to trust the facts of our experts. Here's a third way you can overcome this mountain of fear called the coronavirus. Remember, not everyone will be affected the same. This is what is called a pandemic, meaning it is worldwide. And the facts are very clear. Now, this is not the first coronavirus that has ever come out. In fact, the very first one was discovered in 1966 by two virologists. These are doctor scientists who study viruses. Their name was D.A. Tyrell and M.L. Bano. And they discovered what is called today a coronavirus that affected the respiratory areas of children. Now, since 2003, we've had five human coronaviruses that have been identified, including ones that cause respiratory problems in people. And each one of these coronaviruses has its own different effect and who it targets. And that got me thinking about a story that Jesus told in Matthew 13. It's called the parable of the sower. And if you remember in the parable of the sower, Jesus said this farmer goes out just to throw seed. And he casts the seed. He's not really careful where it falls. Some fell on hard path. Some fell in thorn bushes. Some fell on shallow soil. Some fell in areas where the sun was intensely hot. Some fell where birds came and got the seed and ate it. But some did fall on very good soil. Now, I want you to see what Jesus said even about that. In Matthew 13, 8, he says, Still, other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty, thirty times what was sown. So look at that verse. Even on the best soil, it had different effects and different results. Now, in our country and in the world, those who are primarily going to be affected by this coronavirus are those who are 60 and older who already have a compromised immune system or some related health issue. So listen to me. If you have diabetes, if you have heart disease, if you have cancer, you already have some kind of respiratory problem, you have liver damage, you've got anything right now that is compromising your immunity, you need to heed the words of Jesus at the end of the parable of the sower where he says this, whoever has ears, 
Let him hear. Now, Southside, we need to be the most, most careful about protecting the most vulnerable. And if you're in any of those categories, our church wants to help you. We do. We want to make sure that you get through this crisis. But if you are in this category, listen to me. If you already are in this category, you need to stay home. You need to self-quarantine yourself. We will help you while you're self-quarantining yourself. And just to make sure you understand the facts, this coronavirus is not like the seasonal flu that we get every year. Experts tell us that this bug is 10 times more deadlier than the seasonal flu. And especially for those 60 and above with already a compromised immune system. Medical experts are calling this a novel virus, meaning we have no prior immunity to it and we have no current vaccine for it. Now, did you hear what I said? There are two ways that we can stop this. One is if we were already immune to it or we had a vaccine for it. We have neither one of those right now. So we need to heed what we're being told. We need to listen to them. We need to be cautious without being fearful. We need to be frank without being foolish. We need to have our faith and also the facts. Here's a fourth way we can overcome this coronavirus. Remember, focus on God who remains constant. During the next weeks, we're going to have a lot of changing data, a lot of changing information. And it's going to get confusing. It's going to get frustrating. So one of the ways we as people of faith not allow fear and frustration overtake us is to focus on what remains constant. That is Jesus Christ. Do you remember when we had Hurricane Katrina? We had a lot of changes after that. Remember when we had 9-11? We went through a lot of changes. I remember prior 9-11, if you were going to get on an airplane, your whole family could go back there into the boarding area and wish you well. You can't do that anymore. There will be some major changes that will come from our government on dealing with viruses like this. But I want you to remember this. Until we get those finalities, those facts about how, what these changes are going to be, focus on what's constant. Hebrew, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8, puts it this way. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the key to stability is to focus on what remains rather than what's changing. So focus on what never changes your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you focus on what's changing in the news, you're going to be a basket case. Because no one right now knows currently where this thing is going to go. I love what Paul reminds us of in Ephesians 4. Then we will no longer be like children forever changing our minds about what we believe because someone has told us something different or has cleverly lied to us and made the lie sound like the truth. Instead, we, all, we will lovingly follow the truth at all times. So if you focus on what never changes, on what remains constant, Jesus Christ, you'll get through this. So I want to give you right now seven truths, biblical truths you can focus on in the weeks ahead until this thing subsides. Here's the first truth that will keep you, keep your faith rather than having fear overtake you. God sees everything I'm going through. He sees everything you're going through in this crisis. He knows your fear. He knows your frustration. He knows your heartache, your worry, your concern. He sees it all. Proverbs 15.3 puts it this way. The Lord is watching everything, keeping his eye on both the evil and the good. Listen to me. It says the evil. He sees this evil called the coronavirus. Here's a second biblical truth that can keep you going. God cares about everything I'm going through in this crisis. He cares. He's not aloof. He's not just sitting back wondering what's happening. He deeply cares. First Peter 5, 7 puts it this way. Give all your worries and cares to God, for he cares about you. So as you have this fear that may overtake you or this frustration, cast it on him. Get on your knees. Pray to God. Let him know of your concerns, because he does care for you. I love how the, prof, uh, the prophet Isaiah puts it in Isaiah 41, 10. 
Look what God says. Don't be what? Afraid. For I am with you. Don't be discouraged. For I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. You need to memorize that verse this week. Don't be afraid. Our God is with us. He does care. Here's a third biblical truth you need to remember. God has the power to help me get through this. He has the power. Jesus put it this way in Matthew 19, 26. With people, many things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God has the power, and he will get you through this. Here's a fourth biblical promise you need to focus on. God will find a way to bring good out of this. Read my lips. God never, ever let sin and evil have the final word. Never. Look at Romans 8, 28. We know that God calls us everything. Does everything include the coronavirus? Yes. God calls us everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So you trust that verse. He will find a way to bring good out of this. Here's a fifth biblical truth you need to focus on. I can trust God in and through this crisis. Right now we're being asked to trust our leaders that they're giving the best, most accurate information. I heard this morning that they, the FDA pushed through last night a new test kit that once it hits the market, instead of waiting days to know if you're infected, you can know within a minimum of 45 minutes up to two hours. So think about this. People who thought they were infected, they're being quarantined in hospitals. If they get, when they get tested, they're not infected, what is that going to do? Free up resources. They can come out. They can leave. And we can focus more on those who are sick. Our leaders are doing their very best Contrary to some politicians, they're doing their very best to get on top of this, to eradicate this. Listen to me. Trust God that he is really using them to do this. You don't need to fear what they might be telling us. Trust the facts. I love Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. I memorized it as a kid. I'm going to use it in the New Living Translation. Here it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Notice it says, trust the Lord. Here's a sixth biblical truth you can count on. God will never stop loving me. A lot of times people will say that when national crises happen, it's because God hates us. He doesn't love us. Nothing could be further from the truth. Listen to me. There's nothing you can do to make God love you any more than he already does. And there's nothing you can do to make God love you any less than he already does. I love the promise Paul gives us in Romans 8. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither Our fears for today, that's the coronavirus. Our worries tomorrow, where is this going to end up? Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a promise. Focus on that one. Here's a seventh promise you need to focus on. No matter the final outcome of this crisis... My salvation is secured. If you have given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, there is nothing that can take that from you. We have this wonderful promise from Jesus in John 10. He says, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one can snatch them away from me. So this week, take these seven promises and when you fear anxious, you have fear, you are worried, focus on these seven biblical truths. Now, let me get back to the major points. Point number five, how do I overcome this mountain of fear called the coronavirus? Remember, I'm not alone. God is with me in this crisis. Every stage and at every phase of this crisis, God is with us. This means you will never, ever be alone. Even when you don't feel God there, you're still in his presence. Hebrews 13, 5 puts it this way. For God has said, I will never fail you. I will never abandon you. 
God is with you even when you don't feel that he's with you. You are always in the presence of God. I love another promise from the prophet Isaiah that God gives us. Look at this. God says, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you. I want you to circle a phrase here. I will be with you. God has given you a promise in this virus, this coronavirus, this crisis, he will be with you. Number six. Here's the sixth way we can overcome this mountain of fear called the coronavirus. Remember this. This crisis does not define your story. It's not going to define who we are. It's going to affect who we are, but it doesn't have to define who we are. I love what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 4. We often suffer, but notice. Notice how he says this, but we are not what? We're never crushed. He doesn't let this crush him. Even when we don't know what to do, what? We never give up. In times of trouble, God is with us. And when we are knocked down, what? We get back up again. Because we know that God raised the Lord Jesus Christ to life. And just as God raised Jesus, he will also raise us to life. Then he will bring us into his presence together with you. I want you to circle a phrase. Because we know. If God raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the grave, you know what that is called? It's Easter, baby. And no matter the outcome of this, you and I still win. You do not lose. Listen to me. Let's say I get the coronavirus and it takes my life. Listen, I have not lost. I still win. The virus may kill me, but I will walk in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have not lost. On November 6, 2001, a new TV show aired. It lasted for about eight seasons. It was called 24. It was built on the premise of 24 episodes. They were one-hour episodes. And each episode built on the other. It starred Keith Sutherland, who played Jack Bauer. He worked for the counter-terrorist unit, CTU. And the first episode, some terrorist threat was made known. But each episode didn't wrap it up. It left, it was what we call a cliffhanger. So Audrey and I started watching it, and we got hooked. Did any of you get hooked? We got hooked to this thing. Because we wanted to see how's Jack Bauer going to fix this thing. Now, here's the thing. We knew in episode 24 he would. But the writers were so skilled at writing this, and the actors were so awesome in portraying this, they, we bought it hook, line, and sinker. We waited each week. We knew there was a cliffhanger, but we knew in episode 24, Jack Bauer would resolve it. Now listen to me. This coronavirus is not our story. We can live with hope in the middle of this. And how do we do that? We live in the light of eternity. This virus is not the end of our story. It's not, it doesn't define who we are. Okay? God is going to one day get rid of all sickness and sorrow and sadness and stress. One of my favorite verses is Revelation 21.4. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, no crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. So I said, this is not the end of the story. Here's one more thing I want you to know. Because we're in such uncharted waters right now. Like I said, we've never had anything of this scale in my lifetime. Here's one more final biblical truth you can bank on. How to overcome this mountain of fear? Number seven, remember, God wants to use me to help others. God doesn't just want to get us through this crisis. He wants to use us to help others get through this crisis. God doesn't just want to protect you in this crisis. He wants to protect others in this crisis. So God wants to use you and me to help others. Look at Galatians 6 2. Share each other's burdens and in this way obey the law of Christ. Look at Hebrews 6.10. For God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers. You see, that verse is the difference between non-Christians and Christians. As believers in Jesus Christ, listen to me, we see this as a great opportunity. We see where there's any hurt, 
any bad habit, any hang-up, as an opportunity to share Jesus and to meet a need. And to find that hurt and to console someone has unbelievable impact. So in the days and weeks ahead here at Southside Baptist Church, we're probably going to see some new startup ministries that we didn't have before this. And as I have already said, as a church, we need to be very careful that we protect the most vulnerable, primarily our elderly who are 16 above who already have compromised immune systems. Southside, God's going to give us some great opportunities to help people. Now listen to me. People are scared. They are scared. They're fearful. We as a church can eliminate and reduce some of that fear. In October 1347, a plague began to go across Europe called the Black Plague. Scholars estimate that one-third of the entire world population died from the Black Plague. It decimated Europe. Okay? A hundred million people died. But here's the interesting thing. As people began to flee the cities because they feared it was the cities that were causing this, it was Christians who ran into the cities to take care of the sick and the dying. Do you know what brought about the fall of the Roman Empire? It was Christians. It was Christians who went into where there were plagues in the 4th century. 3rd and 4th century plagues were devastating the Roman Empire. And Christians, instead of fleeing from it, instead of running from it, they ran into those areas. Okay? They ran in those areas where they were sick and people were dying. Listen to me. Hospitals were not created by any government. Hospitals were invented by the church in the 4th century A.D. because Jesus had commanded us he had commanded us to what? To care for the sick, to take those in, care of those in prison, and to take care of those without food and clothing. And just as Christians in 1347 and centuries before that, they ran into these areas to care for the sick and dying. We can help people who are experiencing the same thing today. In 1347, they didn't understand viruses. They didn't understand infections. They didn't understand bacteria. They didn't have any of the modern medicines that we have today. But they saw it as an opportunity to share the gospel. Now listen to me. God is not going to call us to do something stupid and rash. There are ways we can respond in loving ways to help those who are fearful, help those who are quarantined, as well as protect ourselves. If you can help or can help, please go to our church's website. I've written a letter to our church. I updated it again yesterday. And you will find at the top these two buttons. I need help or I can help. If you need help, click on that button. There's a form for you to fill out. And once you fill it out, you hit send. It will come to us here at the church. If you can help, fill out the form. What can you do? Are you willing to go buy groceries for our elderly who are fearful to get out? Go pick up their medicines. If you're willing to do that, fill the form out and send it to us. In fact, there are all kinds of ways that you can do this. You can buy and deliver groceries and supplies to people who need to stay home. Dr. Melanie Toller is a veterinarian in our church, and she got onto this very quickly at the beginning of this week. She sent out, we, we sent out a letter through our church email system from her saying, if you need any help in any way, here's her email address, here's her cell phone number. She's more than willing to help in any way that she can. Pastor Christian, Pastor Steve, myself, our deacons, other church leaders, we're more than willing to help any way that we can. But read my lips. If you're that 60 and above and you're already compromised, you need to stay home. Because you do not know, if you're running around in this city, who you may come in contact that's already infected. So I'll say, we need to do three things. We need to protect the vulnerable. We need to care for the sick. And we need to mobilize the healthy. I want to start our version called Southside DoorDash. If you're not familiar with DoorDash, ask your kids or grandkids. They know, okay? It's a delivery system. A lot of restaurants have it. You just go online, you order your food, you pay for it online, and a guy comes or a girl comes and picks it up, and they bring it to your door. It's called DoorDash. We can go and buy groceries for you. We can set it at your door, and you get it yourself. If, if we need to walk in your house, we can wear masks, we can wear gloves, 
We can protect ourselves as well as you. Here's the second thing you can do. You can call people in our church to see how they are doing. See, our own governor has stopped us from coming together, for good reasons, to having socialization in restaurants. Now, you can still order from those restaurants. You just can't go in them, okay? Now, a lot of our older folks are staying home. And so it's up to us to help them. And one of the things that people are missing today is socialization. We can't come together anymore. We're frustrated. We, we're, God created us to be social beings. So you could call folks in our church. You could say, is there anything you need? Is there anything I could help you with? Do you have a prayer concern I could pray with you about? And you just talk to them. If you don't know, we can send you people's names and numbers. I love what Proverbs 17, says. A cheerful heart is good, what? Medicine. But a broken spirit zaps a person's strength. So we need to bring some joy to people who are already in isolation, who are in quarantine. We need to bring some good medicine to people as our restrictions limit us from socialization. God designed us to be social beings. And if you're willing to help us with this, willing to make some phone calls, please let us know. All you need to say is something like this. Hi, ah, I'm such and such. Pastor Kelly's asked me to call just to see how you're doing. Do you need anything? Do you need groceries? Do you need us to pick up your medicine? Uh, do you have any prayer concerns? Or you can just talk to them on the phone because people are lonely. Here's a third thing. We are utilizing technology for your small groups so that you can still meet via the Internet. Pastor Christian talked about that in his announcements. We have set up the ability through Zoom for you to still go online and you're in a group video class, so to speak, and everybody's video is right there on the screen. So you hear everybody, you see everybody, and you can still talk to each other. All you need is a computer with a webcam. If you don't have that, any smartphone or tablet will work as well. Just go to our website and follow the steps on setting that up. The Bible says in Acts 2 this. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I want you to circle a the phrase there. They met in homes. The very first church, folks met in small groups in homes. It was how the church grew so rapidly. You can still stay connected through your Sunday school class, your small group, by using Zoom. Here's the last thing we're working on. We're live streaming our service each week until we can come back together as a church. You can still go online and download the sermon outline to fill in. You can also, we've set up a, an area for chat on our Facebook page. You can chat to other people watching our service about the points that are being made, about the songs that are being sung. And as you notice, today we have, we have put our team into a skeletal team. We're limiting our number to as close to 10 as we can so that we can still provide this to you. So listen to me. Listen to me. If you're 60 and above and you have a compromised system, stay home. Watch our worship service live. We will begin every week at 1015. You can just go to our Facebook page, Southside Baptist Church, and you will see it there. Or you can go to my letter to our church, and there's a direct link to it as well. We don't need to fear. We can move forward in this in faith. So that's how we overcome the mountain of fear called the coronavirus. Let's pray.